The real star of the team was Joe Fabry, probably the greatest and certainly the hardest working punter in Wyndham history. <laughs> The Bombers were shut out in four games, even with workhorses like Daryl King and Dale Stalker, and linemen like Jerome McDaniel and Joe Lutz, who managed to get tossed out of all the two games that <laughs> They scored only eight touchdowns all year, but three of those touchdowns were tallied by a freshman named Ray Ruff, a name that Portage County would learn well in the coming years. Wyndham made the national news in the fall of 1963 when it elected the youngest mayor in Ohio, 1958 graduate Bill Barker, who had starred on both the gridiron and the basketball court. On the football field, 1963 started out like the movie Groundhog Day. A 6-0 squeaker win over Newton Falls to start the season, followed by three consecutive losses, two by shutout. Although one of those was to Randolph, which would claim the mythical state title that year. But Leo was cementing a rock-solid line featuring Phil Snyder, Bob Leeds, Terry Purdy, John Grafton, Alan Jacobs, with Jerry Miller, and a vicious blocker named Bruce Renniger at end. All he needed to do now was get his running backs in order. Ray Ruff at halfback and Owen Boer at quarterback were the givens. Jim Honnebach and Jim Mansfield were the other starters. But a bevy of sophomores gained a lot of playing time in every game. In fact, in the first four games, Leo had played nearly every boy on the team in every game. <coughs> Halfway through the season, things turned around. The Bombers started gelling, points started coming, and Streetsboro, Ritztown, and Garrettsville fell in quick succession. Only a late season loss to Southeast marred the comeback. The final mark was 4-4, but the groundwork had been laid. Before the last game of the season, Leo made the most brash statement he had ever given a reporter, saying that the Bombers had gotten tired of being pushed around and just did something about it. Bob Weeks represented the rugged Wyndham lineman on the all-conference team, and Leo Cott had given the PCL a warning for 1964 if they were paying attention. Because Leo Cott now had a fabulous quarterback named Roger Steyer, probably second only to Bobby Higgins in the war of great Wyndham arms. Ray Ruff, still only a junior, was widely acclaimed as the best running back in the league. Bruce Renniger had been shifted to fullback to clear a path for Ruff. And there was no linebacker in the league that Bruce Renniger couldn't destroy. The ends were solid with Captain Jerry Miller and converted halfback Larry Barker. But John Grafton was the only starter returning in the interior line. So Cott had to use a rotating lineup of underclassmen, and in the season preview, he said, we have the boys to do the job. The losses to Newton Falls and Aurora, the eventual league champion to open the season, demonstrated that that line needed to grow up really quickly. Moving senior John Grafton to guard, he paired him with a floating rotation of sophomore Tim Stom and junior Arnie Kessling. He shifted Bill Ingram to tackle and decided to take a chance at the other tackle spot on a chubby sophomore who'd been too heavy to play peewee football and instead had been Bruce Renniger's personal tackling dummy since the age of, <laughs> since the age of 12, playing as a seventh grader on the freshman team. His name was George Belton. <laughs> A first victory over Crestwood cinched that inexperienced lineup, with last year's state champion Randolph up next on the Tigers' field. It was one of the most bruising games Portage County had ever seen, an epic 
battle in the trenches. On the last play of the game, with the game tied 6-6, six to six, Cock pulled a new trick out of his coaching bag. He had often toyed with the latest innovations he had picked up at coaching clinics and from the innumerable coaching books in his library, but he only did it in practice. Leo had always told his assistants that if you need to defend against something, you need to understand it first. Now, in games, he usually fell back on his tried and true formation, but not now. With the Bombers on their own 35, Leo had his backfield shift into the radical new formation today widely known as the shotgun, with rifle-armed Roger Steyer as the trigger. While the rookie lineman held off the onrushing Tigers, Steyer calmly pitched the ball 40 yards downfield to a flying Ray Ruff, who outleaped four Randolph defenders, wrestled the ball loose, and sprinted the final 25 yards for a bomber victory. Except for one thing. There was a yellow flag laying on the ground where Ruff had made his catch. Ruff had not committed a violation. In fact, there was no penalty. But the official on the spot had ruled the play a simultaneous catch between Ruff and a defensive back. A simultaneous catch goes to the offensive team but the ball is dead at the spot and cannot be advanced. Game over. The Bombers went on to romp over their last four foes, outscoring them 104 to 20. Ray Ruff scored at least two touchdowns in every game. So it was no surprise when Ruff, Renegar, and junior linebacker Ernie Kessling made first team all conference after the Bombers' second place PCL finish. And during baseball season, Leo had to save the life of that great quarterback, Roger Steyer. Steyer had accidentally stuck his hand through a study hall window, cutting his wrist down in the bubble. And only Leo's quick thinking and tourniquet skills stopped the spurting blood. After Dr. Chang sewed Steyer up, Leo reminded him that he was pitching for the league championship that Friday. <laughs> Leo expected a bomber to be tough. The 1965 Bombers had virtually the entire line returning, but the backfield underwent another redesign. Alan Cott, the coach's firstborn, moved into the quarterback slot. Larry Parker shifted to end, teamed with junior Bill Hall. Pete Bennett replaced the graduated Renegar at halfback, at fullback. And now there were two, Alan, two, Rough Brothers in the backfield. Now, Ray was shorter and more muscular than his brother Danny, who was more agile and as fast as a cheetah. Ray punished tacklers, and Danny made them miss. The most agile runner Leo had coached since Bob Lehman on that immortal 1953 PCL championship team. Cott thought this was his dream team. For the first time ever, he called his Bombers contenders in the record courier preseason tabloid. An opening season loss to Newton Falls didn't change his opinion. He molded his team for the PCL race, and his boys responded. Game after game came and went with wins for the Bombers, five in a row, with the Rough Brothers decimating opponents, just like the Cot Boys had done back at Yorkville High School and at Kent State. It must have felt like deja vu to Leo. But the season was headed for a showdown because the penultimate game would be versus Aurora, which carried a two-year undefeated streak through the season. And they had future college Hall of Famer Tom Curtis at quarterback. 